Now, on HistoryRadio.org, an 1899 story, by Warden Alan Curtis, about the discovery of a living dinosaur, entitled, The Monster of Lake La Mitre. Look. The Monster of Lake Lemaitre, being the narration of James McLennigan, MD, PhD. Dear friend, Enclosed, you will find some portions of the diary it has been my lifelong custom to keep, arranged in such a manner as to narrate connectedly the history of some remarkable occurrences that have taken place here during the last three years. Years and years ago, I heard vague accounts of a strange lake in an almost inaccessible part of the mountains of Wyoming. Various incredible tales were related of it, such as that it was inhabited by creatures which elsewhere on the globe are found only as fossils of a long-vanished time. The lake and its surroundings are of volcanic origin, and not the least strange thing about the lake is that it is subject to periodic disturbances, which take the form of a mighty boiling in the centre as if a tremendous artesian well were rushing up there from the bowels of the earth. The lake rises for a time, almost filling the basin of black rocks in which it rests, and then recedes, leaving on the shore mollusks and trunks of strange trees and bits of strange fern which no longer grow on the earth, at least, and are to be seen elsewhere only in coal measures and beds of stone. And he who casts hook and line into the dusky waters may haul forth ganoid fishes completely covered with bony plates. All of this is described in the account written by Father Lametri years ago. And he there advances the theory that the earth is hollow and that its interior is inhabited by forms of plant and animal life which disappeared from its surface ages ago and that the lake connects with this interior region. Syme's theory of polar orifices is well known to you. It is simply corroborated. I know that it is true now. Through the great holes at the poles, the sun sends light and heat into the interior. Three years ago this month, I found my way through the mountains, here to Lake La Metri, accompanied by a single companion, our friend, young Edward Framington. He was led to go with me, not so much by scientific fervour, as by a faint hope that his health might be improved by a sojourn in the mountains, for he suffered from an acute form of dyspepsia that at times drove him frantic. Beneath an overhanging scrap of wall of rock surrounding the lake we found a rudely built stone house left by old cliff dwellers. Though somewhat drafty, it would keep out the infrequent rains of the region and serve well enough as a shelter for the short time which we intend to stay. The extracts from my diary follow. April 29th, 1896. I had been occupied during the past few days in gathering specimens of the various plants which are cast upon the shores by the waves of this remarkable lake. Framington does nothing but fish and claims that he has discovered the place where the lake communicates with the interior of the earth, if indeed it does, and there seems to be little doubt of that. 
are fishing at a point near the centre of the lake, he let down three pickerel lines tied together, in all nearly 300 feet, without finding bottom. Coming ashore, he collected every bit of line, string, strap and rope in our possession, and made a line 500 feet long, and still was unable to find the bottom. May the 2nd, evening. The past three days have been profitably spent in securing specimens and mounting and pickling them for preservation. Framington has had a bad attack of dyspepsia this morning and is not very well. Changes of climate had a brief effect for the better upon his malady, but seems to have exhausted its force sooner than one might have expected. And he lies on his couch of dry water weeds, moaning piteously. I shall take him back to civilization as soon as he is able to be moved. It is very annoying to have to leave when I have scarcely begun to probe the mysteries of the place. I wish Framington had not come with me. The lake is roaring wildly about, which is strange, as it had been perfectly calm hitherto, and still more strange because I can neither feel nor hear the rushing of the wind, though perhaps that is because it is blowing from the south and we are protected from it by the cliff. But in that case, there ought to be no waves on the shore. The roaring seems to grow louder momentarily. Framington, May 3rd, morning. Such a night of terror we have been through. Last evening, as I sat writing in my diary, I heard a sudden hiss and looking down saw wriggling across the earthen floor what I at first took to be a serpent of some kind, but then discovered was a stream of water which, coming into contact with the fire, had caused the startling hiss. In a moment, other streams had darted in, and before I had collected my senses enough to move, the water was two inches deep everywhere and steadily rising. Now I knew the cause of the roaring, and, rousing Framington, I half dragged him, half carried him to the door, and, digging our feet into the chinks of the wall of the house, we climbed to its top. There was nothing else to do, for, above us and behind us, was the unscalable cliff, and on each side the ground sloped away rapidly, and it would have been impossible to reach the high ground at the entrance to the basin. After a time, we lighted matches, for, with all this commotion, there was little air stirring, and we could see the water, now, halfway up the side of the house, rushing to the west with the force and velocity of the current of a mighty river, and every little while it hurled tree trunks against the house walls with a terrific shock that threatened to batter them down. After an hour or so, the roaring began to decrease, and finally there was an absolute silence. The water, which reached to within a foot of where we sat, was at rest, neither rising nor falling. Presently, a faint whispering began and became a stertorous breathing, and then a rushing like that of the wind, and a roaring rapidly increasing in volume, and the lake was in motion again, but this time the water and its swirling freight of tree trunks flowed by the house towards the east and was constantly falling. And out in the centre of the lake, the beams of the moon were darkly reflected by the sides of a huge whirlpool, streaking the surface of the polished blackness down, down, down the vortex into the beginning of whose terrible depths we looked from our high perch. This morning, the lake is back to its usual level. Our mules are drowned, our boat destroyed, our food damaged, my specimens and some of my instruments injured, and Framington is very ill. We shall have to depart soon, although I dislike exceedingly to do so, as the disturbance of last night, which is clearly like the one described by Father Lemaitre, has undoubtedly brought up from the bowels of the earth some strange and interesting things. Indeed, out in the middle of the lake, where the whirlpool subsided, I can see large quantities of floating things. Logs and branches, most of them probably. But who knows what else? Through my glass, I can see a tree trunk, or rather a stump of enormous dimensions. From its width, 
I judge that the whole tree must have been as large as some of the Californian big trees. The main part of it appears to be about 10 feet wide and 30 feet long. Projecting from it and lying prone on the water is a limb or root some 15 feet long and perhaps two or three feet thick. Before we leave, which will be as soon as Framington is able to go, I shall make a raft and visit the mass of driftwood, unless the wind providentially sends it ashore. May 14th, evening. A day of most remarkable and wonderful occurrences. When I arose this morning and looked through my glass, I saw that the mass of driftwood still lay in the middle of the lake, motionless on the glassy surface. But the great black stump had disappeared. I was sure it was not hidden by the rest of the driftwood, for yesterday it lay some distance from the other logs, and there had been no disturbance of wind or water to change its position. I therefore concluded that it was some heavy wood that needed to become but slightly waterlogged to cause it to sink. Framington, having fallen asleep at about ten, I sallied forth to look along the shores for specimens, carrying with me a botanical can and a South American machete, which I have possessed since a visit to Brazil three years ago, where I learned the usefulness of this sabre-like thing. The shore was strewn with bits of strange plant and shells, and I was stooping to pick one up when suddenly I felt my clothes plucked and heard a snap behind me, and turning about I saw, but I won't describe it yet until I tell you what I did, for I did not fairly see the terrible creature until I had swung my machete round and sliced off the top of its head and then tumbled down into the shallow water where I lay almost fainting. Here was the black log I had seen in the middle of the lake, a monstrous Elasmosaurus, and high above me on the heap of rocks lay the thing's head, with its long jaws crowned with sabre-like teeth and its enormous eyes as big as saucers. I wondered that it did not move, for I expected a series of convulsions, but no sound of a commotion was heard from the creature's body which lay out of my sight on the other side of the rocks. I decided that any sudden cut had acted like a stunning blow and produced a sort of coma, and fearing lest the beast should recover the use of its muscles before death fully took place, and in its agony roll away into the deep water where I could not secure it, I hastily removed the brain entirely, performing the operation neatly, though with some trepidation, and restoring to the head the detached segment cut off by my machete. I proceeded to examine my prize. In length of body, it is exactly 28 feet. In the widest part, it is 8 feet through laterally, and it's some 6 feet through from back to belly. Four great flippers, rudimentary arms and feet, and an immensely long, sinuous, swan-like neck complete the creature's body. Its head is very small for the size of its body, and is very round, and a pair of long jaws project in front, much like a duck's bill. Its skin is a leathery integument of a lustrous black, and its eyes are enormously hazed optics with a soft melancholy stare in their liquid depths. It is an elasmosaurus, one of the largest antediluvian animals, whether of the same species as those whose bones have been discovered, I cannot say. My examination finished, I hastened after Framington, for I was certain that this waif from a long past age would arouse almost any invalid. I found him somewhat recovered from his attack of the morning, and he eagerly accompanied me to the Elasmosaurus. In examining the animal afresh, I was astonished to find that its heart was still beating, and that all the functions of the body, except thought, were being performed one hour after the thing had received its death blow. But I knew that the hearts of sharks had been known to beat hours after being removed from the body, and that decapitated frogs live and have all the powers of motion for weeks after their heads have been cut off. I removed the top of the head to look into it, and here 
another surprise awaited me, for the edges of the wound were granulating and preparing to heal. The colour of the interior of the skull was perfectly healthy and natural. There was no undue flow of blood, and there was every evidence that the animal intended to get well and live without a brain. Looking at the interior of the skull, I was struck by its resemblance to a human skull. In fact, it is, as nearly as I can judge, the size and shape of the brain pan of an ordinary man who wears a seven or an eighth hat. Examining the brain itself, I found it to be the size of an ordinary human brain and, singularly, like it in general contour, though it is very inferior in fibre and has few convolutions. May 5th, morning. Framington is exceedingly ill and talks of dying, declaring that if any natural death does not put an end to his sufferings, he will commit suicide. I do not know what to do. All my attempts to encourage him are of no avail, and the few medicines I have no longer fit his case at all. May 5th evening. I have just buried Framington's body in the sand of the lake shore. I perform no ceremonies over the grave, for perhaps the real Framington is not dead. Though such speculations seem utterly wild. Tomorrow I shall erect a cairn around the mound, unless indeed there are signs that my experiment is successful, though it is foolish to hope that it will be. At ten this morning, Framington's qualms left him. He set forth with me to see the Elasmosaurus. The creature lay in the place where we left it yesterday, its position unaltered, still breathing, all the bodily functions performing themselves. The wound in its head had healed a great deal during the night and I dare say will be completely healed within a week or so. Such is the rapidity with which these reptilian organisms repair damages to themselves. Collecting three or four bushels of mussels, I shelled them and poured them down the elasmosaurus's throat. With a convulsive gasp, they passed down and the great mouth slowly closed. How long do you expect to keep the reptile alive? asked Framington until I have gotten word to a number of scientific friends and they have come here to examine it. I shall take you to the nearest settlement and write letters from there. Returning, I shall feed the Elasmosaurus regularly until my friends come and we decide what final disposition to make of it. We shall probably stuff it. But you will have trouble in killing it unless you hack it to pieces and that won't do. Oh, if only I had the vitality of that animal. There is a monster whose vitality is so splendid that the removal of its brain does not disturb it. I should feel very happy if someone would remove my body, if only I had some of that beast's useless strength. In your case, the possession of a too active brain has injured the body, said I. Too much brain exercise and too little bodily exercise are the causes of your trouble. It would be a pleasant thing if you had the robust health of the Elasmosaurus. But what a wonderful thing it would be if that mighty engine had your intelligence. I turned away to examine the reptile's wounds, for I had brought my surgical instruments with me and intended to dress them. I was interrupted by a burst of groans from Framington, and turning, beheld him rolling on the sand in an agony. I hastened to him, but before I could reach him, he seized my case of instruments, and taking the largest and sharpest knife, cut his throat from ear to ear. Framington! Framington! I shouted, and to my astonishment, he looked at me intelligently. I recall the case of the French doctor who, for some minutes after being guillotined, answered his friends by winking. If you hear me wink, I cried. The right eye closed and opened with a snap. Ah, here the body was dead and the brain lived. I glanced at the elasmosaurus. Its mouth half closed over its gleaming teeth seemed to smile an invitation. The intelligence of the man and the strength of the brain. The living body and the living brain, the curious resemblance of the reptile's brain pan to that of a man flashed across my mind. Are you still alive, Framington? The right eye winked. I seized my machete, 
for there was no time for delicate instruments. I might destroy all by haste and roughness. I was sure to destroy all by delay. I opened the skull and disclosed the brain. I had not injured it, and breaking the wound of the elasmosaurus's head, placed the brain within. I dressed the wound, and hurrying to the house, brought all my store of stimulants and administered them. For some years, my medical fraternity had been predicting that brain grafting will sometime be successfully accomplished. Why has it never been successfully accomplished? Because it has not been tried. Obviously, a brain from a dead body cannot be used, and what living man would submit to the horrible process of having his head opened and portions of his brain taken for the use of others? The brains of men are frequently examined when injured and parts of the brain removed. But parts of the brains of other men have never been substituted for the parts removed. No uninjured man has ever been found who would give any portion of his brain for the use of another. Until criminals under sentence of death are handed over to science for experimentations, we shall not know what can be done in the way of brain grafting. But public opinion would never allow it. Conditions are favourable for a fair and thorough trial of my experiment. The weather is cool and even, and the wound in the head of the Elasmosaurus has every chance of healing. The animal possesses a vitality superior to any of our latter-day animals, and if any organism can successfully become the host of a foreign brain nourishing and cherishing it, the Elasmosaurus, with its abundant vital forces, can do it. It may be that a new era in the history of the world will begin here. May 6th, noon. I think I will allow my experiment a little more time. May 7th, noon. It cannot be imagination. I am sure that as I looked into the Elasmosaurus's eye this morning, there was an expression in them, dim, it is true, a sort of mistiness that floats over them like the reflections of passing clouds. It cannot be imagination. I am sure that as I looked into the Elasmosaurus's eyes this morning, there was an expression in them, dim, it is true, a sort of mistiness that floats over them like the reflections of passing clouds. May 8th, noon. I am more sure than yesterday that there is expression in the eyes. A look of troubled fear, such as is seen in the eyes of those who dream nightmares with unclosed lids. May 11th, evening. I have been ill and have not seen the Elasmosaurus for three days but I shall be better able to judge the progress of the experiment by remaining away a period of some duration. May 12th, noon. I am overcome with awe as I realize the success that has so far crowned my experiment. As I approached the Elasmosaurus this morning, I noticed a faint disturbance in the water near its flippers. I cautiously investigated, expecting to discover some fishes nibbling at the helpless monster and saw that the commotion was not due to fishes, but to the flippers themselves, which were feebly moving. Framington, Framington, I bawled at the top of my voice. The vast bulk stirred a little, a very little, but enough to notice. Is the brain, or Framington, it would perhaps be better to say, asleep? Or has he failed to establish connection with the body? Undoubtedly, he has not yet established connection with the body, and this of itself would be equivalent to sleep, to unconsciousness. As a man born with none of the senses would be unconscious of himself, so Framington, just beginning to establish connection with his new body, is only dimly conscious of himself and sleeps. I fed him, or it, which is the proper designation, will be decided in a few days, with the usual allowances. May 17th, evening. I had been ill for three days and have not been out of doors until this morning. The Elasmosaurus was still motionless when I arrived at the cove this morning. Dead, I thought, but I soon detected signs of breathing and I began to prepare some muscles for it and was intent upon my task when I heard a slight gasping sound and looked up. 
A feeling of terror seized me. It was as if in response to some doubting incantations there had appeared the half-desired yet wholly feared and unexpected apparition of a fiend. I shrieked, I screamed, and the amphitheatre of rocks echoed and re-echoed my cries. And all the time the head of the Elasmosaurus raised aloft to the full height of its neck, swayed about unsteadily, and its mouth silently struggled and twisted as if in an attempt to form words, while its eyes looked at me now with wild fear and now with piteous entreaty. Framington, I said. The monster's mouth closed instantly and looked at me attentively, pathetically so, as a dog might look. Do you understand me? The mouth began struggling again, and little gasps and moans issued forth. If you understand me, lay your head on the rock. Down came the head. He understood me. My experiment was a success. I sat for a moment in silence, meditating upon the wonderful affair, striving to realize that I was awake and sane, and then began in calm manner to relate to my friend what had taken place since his attempted suicide. You are at present something in the condition of a partial paralytic. I would judge, said I, as I concluded my account. Your mind has not yet learned to command your new body. I see you can move your head and neck, though with difficulty. Move your body if you can. Ah, you cannot, as I thought, but it will come in time. Whether you will be able to talk or not, I cannot say. But I think so, however. And now, if you cannot, we will arrange some means of communication. Anyhow, you are rid of your human body and possessed of the powerful vital apparatus you so much envied its former owner. When you gain control of yourself, I wish you to find the communication between this lake and the underworld and conduct some explorations. Just think of the additions to geological knowledge you can make. I will write an account of your discovery, and the names of Framington and MacLennigan will be among those of the greatest geologists. I waved my hand in enthusiasm, and the great eyes of my friend glowed with a kindred fire. June 2nd, Night the process by which Framington had passed from his first powerlessness to his present ability to speak and command the use of his corporeal frame had been so gradual that there had been nothing to note down from day to day. He seems to have all the command over his vast bulk that its former owner had, and, in addition, speaks and sings. He is singing now. The north wind has risen with the fall of night, and out there in the darkness I hear the mighty organ pipe tones of his tremendous, magnificent voice chanting the solemn notes of a Gregorian, the full-throated Latin words mingling with the roaring of the wind in its wild and weird harmony. Today, he attempted to find the connection between the lake and the interior of the earth, but the great well that sinks down in the center of the lake is choked with rocks, and he discovered nothing. He is tormented by the fear that I will leave him and that he will perish of loneliness. But I shall not leave him. I feel too much pity for the loneliness he would endure. And besides, I wish to be on the spot should another of those mysterious convolutions open the connection between the lake and the lower world. He is beset with the idea that other men discover him. He may be captured and exhibited in a circus or museum and declares he will fight for his liberty, even to the extent of taking the lives of those attempting to capture him. As a wild animal, he is the property of whomsoever captures him, though perhaps I could set up a title to him on the ground of having tamed him. July 6th. One of Framington's fears has been realized. I was at the pass leading into the basin watching the clouds grow heavy and pendulous over a knoll in the pass, when a net appears, followed by its bearer, a small man, unmistakably a scientist. But I did not note him well, for as he looked down into the valley, suddenly there burst forth with all the power and volume of a steam calliope, the tremendous voice of Framington, singing a Greek song of Anacreon to the tune of where did you get that hat?
and the singer appeared in a little cove. The black column of his great neck raised aloft his jagged jaws wide open. The poor little scientist, he stood transfixed. His butterfly net dropped from his hand, and as Framington ceased his singing, curvetted and leaped from the water and came down with a splash that set the whole cove washing, and laughed a guffaw and echoed among the cliffs like the laughing of a dozen demons, he turned and sped through the pass at all speed. I skip all entries for nearly a year. They are unimportant. June the 30th. 1897. A change is certainly coming over my friend. I began to see it some time ago, but refused to believe it and set it down to imagination. A catastrophe threatens. The absorption of the human intellect by the brute body. There are precedents for believing it possible. The human body has more influence over the mind than the mind has over the body. The invalid, delicate Framington, with refined mind is no more. In his stead is a roisterous monster whose boisterous and commonplace conversation betrays a constantly growing coarseness of mind. No longer is he interested in my scientific investigations, but pronounces them all bosh. No longer is his conversation such as an educated man can enjoy, but slangy and diffused iterations concerning the trivial happenings of our uneventful life. Where will it end? In the absorption of the human mind by the brute body, in the final triumph of matter over mind, and the degradation of the most mundane force, and the extinction of the celestial spark? Then, indeed, will Edward Framington be dead and over the grave of his human body can I finally erect a headstone, and then will my vigil in this valley be over. Fort D. A. Russell, Wyoming. April 15, 1899. Professor William G. Brayfogle. Dear Sir, The enclosed intact manuscript and the fragments which accompany it came into my possession in the manner I am about to relate, and I enclose them to you, for whom they were intended by their late author. Two weeks ago I was dispatched into the mountains after some Indians who had left their reservation having under my command a company of infantry and two squads of cavalrymen with mountain howitzers. On the seventh day of our pursuit, which led us into a wild and unknown part of the mountains, we were startled at hearing from somewhere in front of us a succession of bellowings of a very unusual nature, mingled with the cries of a human being, apparently in the last extremity, and rushing over a rise before us, we looked down upon a lake and saw a colossal, indescribable thing engaged in rending the body of a man. Observing us, it stretched its jaws and laughed, and in saying this, I wished to be taken literally. Part of my command cried out that it was the devil, and turned and ran. But I rallied them, and thoroughly enraged at what we had witnessed, we marched down to the shore, and I ordered the howitzers to be trained upon the murderous creature. While we were doing this, the thing kept up a constant babbling, that bore a distinct resemblance to human speech, sounding very much like the jabbering of an imbecile or a drunk trying to talk. I gave the command to fire and to fire again, and the beast tore out into the lake in its death agony and sank. With the remains of Dr. McLennigan, I found the foregoing manuscript intact and the torn fragments of the diary from which it was compiled, together with other papers on scientific subjects all of which I forward. I think some attempt should be made to secure the body of the Elasmosaurus. It would be a priceless addition to any museum. Arthur W. Fairchild, Captain, USA. You have just heard an 1899 story by Warden Alan Curtis about the discovery of a living dinosaur entitled 
The Monster of Lake La Mitre. George Snow was the scientist, and John Carrick was the captain. The sound editor was Michael Henro Quinn. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free radio stream, promoting knowledge of literature and history.